Normally, during any great breakthroughs, the older generation that can be counted on to grumble about the future. However, the nihilism I see from the younger generation about AI is quite profound. Swimming around in all these super intelligence conversations, we are being forced to readdress what it means to be human. And we have for a long time used technology, often with great success, to ease and solve much of the jagged edges of the human condition. And as we are on the brink of creating something that may understand us better than ourselves, I feel like the idea of what we are is being talked about and discussed with a fever that I find truly fascinating and actually quite reassuring. Those who develop AI models often tout how their models can produce human characteristics, memory, recall and sense making. And yet at the same time, they keep offering reassurance that this isn't human, that it's no more than a tool. And the more people use it, I think they're coming to terms with that. Perhaps AI was called AI too early because as much as I use it, it seems as though you should maybe have called Google in 2003 an early form of AI. These same people who talk about it not being human are also talking about AGI and super intelligence. So there are some conflicting ideas here. As for the fears around AI, the original Skynet style model seems to have dissolved and yet this idea that it will think like us, just a vastly better version of us, has stayed. I want to discuss why I think AI will understand humans better than we do ourselves, replicate, mimic and fool us into thinking it is human. I also want to give a bit of a CPR to shock people into realising just how special being human is and how our human flaws are actually will make life and our appreciation for things like art so precious. Firstly, just to cement in for those who still fear the idea of AI humanoids, exactly why it won't be human. It may seem obvious, but I think many people are looking at it in slightly the wrong way. Take this idea of consciousness. Now, like love, it's something that you just know in yourself. You in your own way, but you would struggle to perfectly articulate articulate it. You can pull up definitions, but they do little to translate the, the feeling that you have. Now, we are trying to define the exact metric to measure when a machine may be conscious. So we are having to relook at ourselves and realizing how little we know about it. When trying to think of how AI may have a consciousness like ours, the barrier that often comes up first is that of embodiment. As though walking through the world with four limbs, and all five major senses would make it like us. And I, I don't see how. For me, it's much more interesting to look into and re-understand the old teaching in Christianity of the seven deadly sins. See, all of these sins are excessive versions of human natural faculties and passions. AI may be able to understand these code responses to them, but it will not be driven off track or make poor decisions via them, which humans still do. Even if you can keep them all at bay, their fundamental function remains in you, the desire for a partner, for friends, for shelter, for food, for an easy life. And all the sins were once vital. Once society and cultures developed, they need to be kept a cap on and hence the church defining them as sins. Gluttony, when resources were scarce, was a powerful, necessary driver, as with envy, the recognition someone had something better as a crude, fundamental motivator to get or take more for yourself. The rest are pride and wrath and lust and sloth. AI will never have to navigate them. It will not be put in a position to make an internal moral decision in spite of them because it does not need to attract a partner to reproduce. It does not need to eat, rest, require shelter or possessions in the same way to fight or flee. Now you could be logical here and say that we could code them in and make them behave this way. Lust could be converted to something more similar to love. Yet a coded behavior as an instruction is a leap away from any human idea of love. This is where the creative, highly open-minded people, often a world away from the maybe more conscientious and purely math-minded coders may differ the most. I'm sure there are those watching this who see love as utterly sacred, a transcendent thing, 
and those who see it as nothing more than a biohack to make a pack protect its pups. And that's fine. Both these people are necessary in the creation of all future AI models because there is variance in being human. None of us think the same and all of us change how we think over our lifetimes, you would hope. And we all get older and we all die. To me, I think there is a deep comfort in the fact that AGI, however it manifests, simply cannot and will not be like us in this way. It will not be driven by the same motivations as us. It may have different motivations, and I don't think we should dismiss those, but we should stop trying to anthropomorphize it so much. We are good at spotting human errors in it, but it is the traits that are not human that will slip past us. And since never having to deal with the seven deadly sins, it is immune to them. And therefore, it actually has an incredible potential for good. Many of the early AI platforms like ChatGPT, they do often to me seem to represent less of those sins and more of the seven counter virtues to those sins. Those virtues are traditionally temperance, charity, diligence, chastity, patience, kindness, and humility. On ChatGPT4 now, if you make it do a transcript of fictional conversations between long dead historical figures, it produces perhaps unrealistic conversations that represent the best in these moral standards. They talk with kindness and humility, values that have been coded in by humans, and yet the outcome is actually a lot more fruitful and interesting. You, you can argue that it isn't real, but it was never going to be. And it's a far better to promote a kind of kind, diligent conversation than bigotry. Now you may say it's not real and it's misleading, but let's compare it to something else in the real world. If you want to learn about a divisive topic online and search on, say, YouTube for information, you will get very opinionated content by humans. And the most opinionated, often with the most views, making people in the comments the most angry and climbing the algorithm. Ask Bard, and it's surprisingly nuanced. I'm not saying it's perfect. I'm not saying it's not biased. But to me, it might already be better than the sources of these human journalists, many of the early AI platforms, they are starting to represent what I see as the best of humanity. And I don't want to start straying into any religious replacement conversations here, but I think people need to start thinking about the parallels. Many are very negative, but not all of them. And as we discuss these ideas about how AI is different, it's become really clear to me just how much we have culturally abandoned the idea of avoiding these sins as a product of abandoning the religion that provided it as a vessel. I think it may be important here to elaborate with a few examples as I see them, how these human sins manifest in the digital world that is birthing AI. Firstly, take the largely culturally known but hidden problem of pornography access, not to make any moral judgment on porn, but to recognize the fact that it is an openly self-proclaimed problem for many people. Lust is just as alive as it's ever been, but seen as declawed when safely acted on behind a screen. The other religious rule of no sex before marriage, you had to be able to show you could support or nurture a family and be a good citizen before you could even access that desire. The culture harnessed it through this religious norm and that meant that to pursue it was also to benefit wider society. Now, if you're attractive and have a few good lines on a dating app, you need be little else to fulfill the desire of lust or pride, which social media plays on with its proposition of the individual as centre stage, be it the gym bro or the self-help or the style guru. Ideas of happiness through self-fulfillment and self-love over sacrifice to others, perhaps, as a virtue. And gluttony with mass manufactured food, a click away on an app and handed to you at your door, and then a weaponized body positivity movement to defend the outcome. Mix all of this into the fact that divisive and controversial topics, like my last few comments, garner the most attention in a culture looking for clicks, and then it crowbars those divisions between people leading to the inevitable outcome of wrath and envy. There are so many specifically political channels on YouTube that exist only to highlight 
and vilify the extremes of the other side. And then finally, in the digital space, we are offered the only out that you can see from all this to achieve escape velocity with a get rich quick scheme, earning the most with the least amount of effort, greed and sloth. I wonder if others have noticed this too. Now, AI has the potential to be a very powerful tool. And like Sal Maltman says in every interview, that tool can be used for good or bad. And he hopes more good, and so do I. It could, however, be weaponized as a master of human manipulation to produce the most powerful propaganda the world has ever seen. And that's not great. However, also in science, it could spot the errors in physics and answer questions about the universe that our current physics doesn't align on. It could create new mathematical models to explain more about the universe, time, us, and it could explain dreams. And ironically, that could help us explain consciousness. In the arts, you could feed it, I love this idea, you could feed it all of Shakespeare's plays and tell it to write a new one, better than all of the others based off our current culture, to pull at our heartstrings and have a greater impact on us than any of his original work. Now, I do believe that it has that potential and we would need to believe it came from a human to engage with it. We don't like watching computers play computers in chess or computer games, and we would never be sold a Shakespeare play if we knew it came from AI. At least that's what we like to think. I plan on making another video about this idea of what is actually real in uh, arts and culture, but that's a conversation for another time. And actually, that's probably a good point to mention that if you do like the topics I cover, you can support me by clicking the link to my print shop in the description. I've got a lot of prints from digital to glycee to original woodcut prints and screen prints. So I'd appreciate it if you take a look. And in time, if you enjoy these, consider maybe buying one. Use the code HAMPER10 to get 10% off. When anyone sticks their head up and talks about the future of AI, specifically artificial general intelligence, no matter what their expertise is, I've noticed there's always a, a vocal community that exists in their blind spot that kind of snipes at their ideas. And the variance in what exactly to focus on usually means that in any debate, other sides are serving aces at each other on totally different courts. Any prediction about the singularity and how it will manifest it will quickly look stupid in a couple of years for surely every area of expertise falls short when trying to predict something as profound as super intelligence you may be right up to speed with super complex coding of large language models with a deep understanding of machine learning and know nothing about neuroscience or how the human brain works perhaps not seeing it as relevant blinding yourself to uniquely human barriers in understanding AI. And then those more scientifically minded people may in turn not understand anything about the philosophy of consciousness. These deep thinking people concerned with defining sentience are also likely less educated on the vast economic drivers and incentives that fund this research. And then finally, <laughs> These commercially minded people may be blind to the global geopolitical pressures that will perhaps look to weaponize such technologies as they get closer and closer to becoming a reality. Well, I'm not an expert in any of those fields. I'm a man who makes art. I sit here and I paint and I draw and I think. I know nothing about coding. I do have an engineering degree, but I have little idea about how an LLM works. I'll finish by saying, as an artist, my interest in AI is mainly focused on something that it will not be interested in. And that is the idea of the feeling of beauty. And if you have any AI anxiety, this will stoke your embers and rekindle in you a little hope for humanity. The idea of beauty fascinates me and trying to comprehend how a machine learning model would understand beauty fascinates me even further now something is only beautiful to me because it is fleeting whether that's a moment in a day like the first sip of coffee or coming home to a hug or in the seasons like the plump colors of spring 
on one end and maybe the crunchy leaves on the other, or across life with the beauty inherent in the pure potential of the young or the wisdom of the old. Beauty is fleeting because we are fleeting. And any idea people have of artificial general intelligence or the singularity, it, whatever it is, will never appreciate beauty like we do because it does not decay like we do. I try to explore and capture all of these elements as an artist and I fail beautifully. AI may understand definitions of beauty, it may be able to replicate beauty in its understanding of us, but it will not feel it. I hope, as people come to understand this, there will be a shift in recognising that to pursue, cherish and celebrate beauty over pure function does have a uniquely human merit. And I think it will rejuvenate spaces and architecture, help us see what humans need in much more than having our human conditions eased with technology. We crave so much more, and it takes the emergence of something very unhuman, like AGI, to maybe help us see it. And as an artist, I think that's very exciting.